Hey guys, welcome back to Keys to the Cosmos. This is video number two in my new series, Astrophotography Target Tips. Hopefully you were able to catch my first uh, video of this series on IC1396, also known for the elephant's trunk within it. And as I mentioned in that video, this is gonna be a series where I'm getting up super early in the morning and shooting these targets well before they should be in order to put together a video like this so that when you're ready to shoot it, maybe in June, July, into the summer months, in those prime hours, you're gonna need, you're gonna have everything that you need to know to go into it and have a lot of confidence that you're gonna get a really great image out of it. So we talk about things like locating it, um, framing it up on the back of your DSLR, integration time, and even some processing tips. So hopefully you're able to catch that video. If not, please check it out. Um, but for this one, we're gonna talk about a new target, and that is um, the North American Nebula as well as the Pelican Nebula. Now the North American Nebula is the star of the show in this one. It's a little bit brighter, it's definitely bigger, and in my opinion, a little bit more beautiful. But it's nice to be able to get that Pelican Nebula in, in the shot as well, and it's right beside it. So it's definitely what I would recommend for your first time anyway. So when it comes to this uh, target, to me, it is the best beginner target for the summer skies. And there's three reasons for that. The first one is it's easy to locate using surrounding stars. Um, it's very bright. I think it's magnitude six, five or six, somewhere around there. So that's quite bright. And the last reason is it's quite big. So that sort of ties back into the first point of easy to locate. Not only is it easy to locate using the surrounding stars, but it's really big. So you're, you're bound to capture a piece of it on that first test shot. And from there you can adjust your telescope and, and sort of center it up for your framing. Um, it's, to me, it's also a very beautiful nebula. Um, you know, it doesn't have crazy detail. It's not as, you know, like the, the first one there, IC1396, where there's a lot going on, dark gas, and, you know, just a lot of variation. But it's just a big, bright, beautiful um, nebula. And I think you're going to be amazed the first time you see it on the back of your DSLR, because it is pretty pretty big and, and pretty amazing that it's out there in our night sky. Uh, and we're just waiting to see it with the right equipment and the right knowledge. So let's get right into it. How do we locate uh, the North American Nebula? Well, we talked about in the first video, the constellation the Cygnus and how we use Cygnus to find Cepheus, which is where IC 1396 is. But for this video, the North American Nebula, we're gonna stay right in Cygnus. And Cygnus, if you've never looked into it or don't know much about it, it's full of amazing emission nebula and planetary nebula targets. It's really is, you could spend all summer just uh, imaging Cygnus, that's how great it is. So I always love to see Cygnus coming up in the night sky. Now, if you've never seen Cygnus for yourself, the easiest way to find it is to use the star Vega in uh, the summer sky. It's in the eastern sky, and it's um, pretty much the brightest star, uh, star there is. It almost looks like a planet, that's how bright it is. So once you look in the eastern sky, at this time of year in May, usually after 11, 11.30 p.m., Look down and a little bit to the left or towards the north, and there you'll find the constellation Cygnus. Now, generally speaking, the center part of Cygnus is always um, visible, no matter where you are. You know me, I'm in Bordeaux, eight and a half, nine skies, and I can see Cygnus on any night, as long as there's no clouds. And it's sort of that constellation I always go to. As soon as I go outside, I look up for it and say, oh, there's Cygnus, and then from there I can get my bearings. So it's very recognizable. It almost looks sort of like a cross, in the sky, if you can't see that one, uh, the one star that's a little bit more um, faint, you definitely can see the four that create sort of a T. And that's sort of the beginning of the wings, which is Cygnus the swan, that's what it represents. And that back star is the tail. So you're looking sort of for a T in the sky, and that's when you know you've found Cygnus. Now the two main stars we're gonna focus on are the two back ones in the body of Cygnus, the constellation, and that is, uh, Sadar, which is the one sort of more in the middle, and the one at the very back is Deneb. And Deneb's the one we're really gonna focus on because that's where, right, the closest one to North America. And I believe it's the brightest. Sadar might be a bit brighter, I can't remember exactly, but they're both very bright stars. If there's two stars you're gonna see easily in, in Cygnus, it's those two. So once you've found Deneb, the back star of that constellation, I oftentimes use it to do some focusing um, before I start imaging. So assuming that you've balanced your mount already, um, center uh, Deneb in your in the back of your DSLR and then do your focusing. And then all you need to do from there 
is of course take your bat knob mask off and just go down and to the left and just a little bit below and off to the side there is the north american nebula pretty hard to miss as i mentioned it's big and it's bright and you're bound to catch a piece of it even on your test shot so once you've done a test shot i would say 25 30 seconds is more than enough for you to see it on the back of your screen even if you're using an unmodified dslr then um, you can sort of gauge where you are if maybe you've got most of it in this on the screen or you need to adjust but you want to get a dead center on the back of your camera now for this case i use my red cat 51 as a telescope to image this to me that's the perfect telescope for this target it's 250 millimeters so that's quite wide field and uh, assuming you're not trying to get super close in to the North American nebula itself, if you want to shoot that and the Pelican together, to me, this is the perfect telescope. It gives you just enough room to be able to crop around it, um, but not so much so that you really need to crop in order to see the details in this beautiful target. So to me, the Red Cat 51 is perfect or something like that. You could even use a 200 millimeter um, camera lens. You're going to have to crop a little bit, but uh, it's definitely doable. And you could probably go up to my Sharp Star 76, but at that point, you're really um, tight into the target and you're gonna have to be really careful if you're doing multiple night imaging, you're gonna have to make sure you align it just right each night. So that's why I say, give yourself some room, use something more like the Red Cat. So when it comes to framing, as I mentioned, um, if you're gonna be doing more than one night, um, I like to use a star that's visible in, the, in a one minute exposure, even less than that. Um, to do my sort of aligning. So for me, I use the star Xi Cygni. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation on that, but that's the star that's just below the North American nebula. And what I tried to do with that star with a test shot, it's not visible, at least in my skies, um, but I know in getting the, the North America sort of centered, on taking a test shot, that star is probably the brightest one in the picture. So what I tried to do was um, get it just center or just off center to the right, and um, just off of the bottom. So I want that star to be in the picture and I don't want it to be right at the very bottom. Uh, give yourself a little bit of room to crop if you need to, but focusing on that star and getting it just up from the bottom and just off to the right. And that's what I tried to do every night. And you'll see in my stacked image, I had very little stacking lines, um, which is what you want, obviously. So I really did not have to crop a lot to remove any sort of imperfections in my stacked image. So once you've done that, you framed it up, um, you can begin obviously shooting. And I wanna mention uh, something because I've actually shot this target twice before. The first time I ever shot it, it was the second image I ever uh, tried to capture. And here it is here. This was like two weeks into the hobby. As you can tell, not the prettiest picture. Um, you know, my processing definitely needed a lot of work. This is probably 45 minutes to an hour at the most, but um, you know, I, got, I was able to get an image and I was proud of it. Uh, this was shot with uh, the Red Cat as well, but with a just a light pollution filter and not a narrow band, which is what I wanna get into next. The next picture, I think I shot this roughly a month later. Um, this was done with all the same equipment, but a lot more integration time, and you can tell my processing skills had, had greatly improved off that first one. So. I cropped it as little, a little bit more as well. You can see it's a little bit better, a little bit closer up. And um, you can see a lot more detail in this picture. And I'll be referring to this picture a couple times throughout. Obviously, I want to save the final picture in this video for the very end. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. But I'll be using this one as a reference. But in having shot it twice already, I want to show you a picture here of two single um, one-minute exposures. One with the light suppression uh, filter that I mentioned, the CLS CCD, and one with a narrow band filter. You've heard me go on about those, like the up along L Extreme in this case, but here's the difference. Here's that picture now. These are both one minute, both using the same telescope, but you can see quite a difference. On the um, CLS CCD, the light pollution suppression filter, you can see a lot more stars. There's also a lot less contrast between the nebula and the sky background. And, you know, it's not that you can't use a filter like this. My second image was decent. Um, had I sunk even more time, it probably would have been even better. But look at now the narrow band one, the Optolong L Extreme. Uh, less stars are visible because, again, that's a more aggressive filter. It's filtering out those, those more faint stars. 
But right off the bat on that one minute exposure, there's a lot more contrast between the nebula and the background. I couldn't believe uh, the first test exposure I did um, using this filter, one minute exposure, and see the entire nebula on the back of my screen with the Pelican Nebula. And the Pelican Nebula is a little bit more faint. So that was really impressive. Um, I was pretty blown away. And it just sort of reinforces what I always say. If you're in light polluted skies and you can afford it, try to get yourself a really good narrow band filter like the Optal and L Extreme. But this goes to show the difference and also shows you sort of what you can expect to see on the back of your camera. Of course, keep in mind, I'm using a modified DSLR. So if you're using an unmodified one, it might be a little bit more faint. So just keep that in mind. So let's talk about um, integration time. Now this is one of those targets that I really don't think you need to sink a ton of time into. Because as I mentioned, it's already a very bright target. And there's not a lot of crazy detail that you're going to pull out just by adding another hour or two. I shot this one this time around at four hours. I stacked it up and did a quick process and I did it again at seven hours. Now yes, the seven hour image I'll show you at the end of this video is definitely nicer. And it's the one that I would choose. But to be honest, there's not a huge difference. So if you have limited time and availability, don't worry about it. Another reason why I think this is a great beginner target, you don't need to spend a ton of time uh, imaging it. I would say uh, three to five hours would be perfect. Um, that's just enough to get enough detail to get that nebula, the Pelican Nebula to pop out as well and to get yourself a really beautiful image. There is a few areas that will benefit from adding more time. I mean, obviously noise is always the issue, right, with astrophotography. When you don't spend enough integration time, you get noise. It sort of looks, all the gas around it looks fuzzy and sort of broken up. It doesn't look smooth like gas should look. And so that that is definitely, but that's always the case with astrophotography. The more time you spend on it, the less noise you're gonna get. It Noise is sort of like, the more noise, the less noise you have, the more clean and crisp the image looks. So just for that reason alone, that's why I say you should still spend at least three to five hours if you can, just to eliminate as much noise as possible. But and, and in addition to noise, uh, features like the Cygnus wall, I'll show it here on my second image. Um, that's sort of the most predominant uh, feature of this particular target. A lot of guys will zoom in just on that and, and, and image that part of it. It's a really beautiful piece of gas. Um, with a lot of sort of details in it and structure to it. So that definitely benefits from a little bit more integration time. As I mentioned as well, the Pelican Nebula, it is a little more faint. So the more time you spend um, on that nebula, the more it's going to pop out and you'll see it. Assuming, of course, that you want it to be in the image like I did it in all of mine. So yeah, three to five hours integration time. Don't go crazy if you know, you're already limited on time and you're going to be pretty blown away, I think, by what you're going to be able to get. So all that being said, in my particular image this time around, I got seven hours of integration time shot over four different nights. So, um, you know, that's that's a good amount of time for a bright emission. I, mean, I wanted to really see what I could get with seven hours. And here's my stacked image of my seven hours altogether. It's pretty, it's pretty typical. Um, you see a few stars. Uh, you see a little bit of the nebula if you really look, but nothing crazy. Uh, you can see there's a lot of processing to do from this point, which moves us nicely into um, some processing tips. Now, I will say, um, in this case, more, uh, less is more, for sure. It's one of those um, targets that you really can just do a quick stretch and levels adjustment, um, a star reduction, and hit auto color, you know, in Photoshop, and you'll have yourself a really nice image. like. I really can't stress that enough. Do not overstretch this image. You don't need to. I think you'll find within three or four stretches, um, assuming you're able to sing three to five hours, maybe maybe five or six at the most, you're going to already have like a lot of nebulosity showing. So you don't need to go crazy. And of course, every time you stretch, you want to do a levels adjustment and just sort of bring it back in again. You're probably going to get some um, funky colors once you stretch it a few times. But as I mentioned in my processing video, that's where you use the sampler in your levels adjustment um, box. And you click on that middle one and then click on the screen and, and use that to sort of correct the color. If you don't know what I'm talking about, definitely go back to my processing video where I process the horse head nebula. And I talk about that a little bit more in depth. So definitely watch that so you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But another reason you're going to want to focus on that sort of sampler and, and testing different parts of the picture the background right you never click on the nebula itself 
is that um, depending where you click, you're going to get either a lot more background gas or a lot less. It depends what you want. Um, what is your preference? Do you like a lot of gas in the area? It is a very gassy area. Or do you want it to be more of a dark background and just have the target itself popping out? In my case, um, I think I wanted somewhere in the middle. I do like surrounding gas. I mean, space is full of gas. Uh, I don't like when pictures are just black background. That's definitely not natural. Some guys, guys do that just to make it pop out more. But in my opinion, I like to embrace that gas a little bit. That's part of the space. So there's a lot around the North American nebula. And that would be one of your biggest challenges when it comes to processing. It's sort of just like the IC1396 in that first video, sort of isolating the target itself and trying to pull it out a little bit more so it's more uh, predominant in the picture. But if you use that sampler that I mentioned in your levels adjustment towards the end of stretching, click on the background in various spots and see what you like. Um, you'll notice in some points the nebula, nebulosity will pop up more and the background sort of fades away and in some, some parts of the image you'll see all of a sudden a lot of gas around it. So decide what you like, maybe test it with a couple of different options and see what you like. But um, that was sort of the key for me I found using that sampler is really what helped me get a better idea of what I wanted and then from there to do you know more fine adjustments in processing. So once you've done I would say four or five stretches, your levels adjustment, as I mentioned, do a star reduction if you like. There's a lot of stars in this picture. You gotta remember we're getting close to the Milky Way core so there's a lot of stars in this area. Me personally I always do a star reduction. I like the the nebula itself to be the star of the show. And then just hit something like auto color, auto tone, um, auto contrast, that's in the uh, Photoshop um, up at the top there, the tabs, and you're gonna have yourself a, a beautiful picture right off the top. You could almost stop right there and you're good. From there though, if you wanna do some more processing, um, what I did was I sort of focused on the Cygnus wall, we talked about that, so I, I lassoed that off. As well, I did the, the bright section of the Pelican Nebula, and there's another bright section within the North America as well. Those are sort of the three brightest portions of your image. Um, so what I did is I lassoed all those off at the same time, and then I just went into my camera raw filter, um, drop down menu, and open that up. And then I played with, you know, contrast, uh, structure, just to sort of really bring that wall out, those details of those three sections, just to almost sort of give it like a 3D look. Um, I like to try to make those areas, I like to always have a certain areas that really pop out. As soon as you look at an image, you're like, oh wow, that's, you know, your eye is drawn to those areas. So that's what I tried to do. And then even just the image itself as a whole, I would just sort of play with the softness. I, as I always mention, I like to get, it's gas that we're taking a picture of, so I like it to be soft looking. And then from there, once I make it soft, I sort of bring it back and um, there's a lot of options in the camera raw filter there too sort of bring out the details, um, some of that flowing gas. There's just some of it you can see is heavier, lighter, thicker, um, thinner. So all those things give it just a little bit of variety. I never like it to be just a splotch on the screen and it just looks like a blob, you know? Uh, that's definitely doesn't do these, these beautiful targets uh, justice. You want them to have a lot of, as much variation as possible and to almost look like it's just flowing gas in space, but, but it, that's holding its shape. And hopefully that's what I was able to accomplish in my final image when I show it. But yeah, that's sort of processing. I say less is more. You don't need to go crazy. This is not one that I think you're gonna be spending a ton of time trying to bring it out and, and bring out details. Just get it to a point where it's nice and bright and you know, try to pull out certain details within it and just try to give it that nice soft feel. Um, you know, I went, you'll see on my final one, I went for more of a pinkish hue. That's what I like personally. Some people like the, the more red is the way it appears in the sky. I'm not a big fan of red. I prefer softer pink, but that's a matter of preference. So that's something you can play with with your, your uh, colors adjustment tabs, um, either in the camera raw filter or even just in your main adjustments in Photoshop. So that's something you can play with and have fun with. But for me personally, I like it softer and I, I like to sort of tone down the red. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, it's a beautiful target. I think you're gonna have a lot of fun with it. And what's so nice is you're not gonna be spending two hours trying to find it in the night sky and getting frustrated. It's super easy to find. As long as you can find Cygnus, you'll see the neb on the end there, and there it is just below it. And you know, spend some time, frame it up nice, 
And as I, as I mentioned, use that star or something else in the image that you can make a mental note of. If you're gonna be imaging it a second, third, fourth night, um, make sure you make a mental image of where that was. Sometimes I even take a picture of my um, DSLR, the back of the DSLR with just with my phone. And I look at it and I remember, okay, yes, this is the sort of the way I had it positioned. And then I try to copy that the second time around. So that's it for that one, guys. I know I ended up going on a bit. I was trying to keep this one shorter, but what can I say? I figure I include as much as I can. There's never too much knowledge, right? Um, the more you know, the more hopefully success you're going to have when you go to image this. Um, so without further ado, here is my next, my seven hour image of the North American Nebula. And before I show it, I just want to mention, I have another one coming up. I, last night I was out shooting. You can probably see it in my eyes. Um, I may go one more night. I really want this to be one of my best images, but we're going to be staying in Cygnus as a little bit of a hint as what the next target in this series will be. So stay tuned for that. And guys, like always, always feel free to comment your success stories with North America, what you struggled with, and what you're looking forward to imaging in Cygnus, the constellation, this coming summer. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. All the best out there, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.